Welcome to the I Get Paid by the Word title and The Rock Cried Out No Hiding Place. I'd just like to say, really quick as an aside, that uh, I really like this episode. If you asked me, you know, a couple years ago, what's your favorite B5 episode? I'm not sure I can name a single episode that's my favorite, but this is among the episodes that comes to mind, along with Passing Through Gethsemane. Uh, this is... I, I really like this episode. It was nice to see Brother Theo again. And even though he had a very small role, I liked Eric Avari coming back... Uh, I shouldn't say coming back. Coming into the first place as the rabbi. Uh, he's a he's a great actor. I, I love him and everything I've seen him in. So, I'll... <laughs> There's two basic plots in this episode uh, that are thematically linked. The A plot and the B plot. Kind of unlike last week. And... The A plot is all about the war against the shadows, as you might imagine. But before we get to that, I want to mention that they're moving forward with the whole telepaths going to the front lines thing, making a real effort of fighting back. I also find it interesting because Jakar basically says, I want to send my people with them. I find that interesting because the episode never bothers to further go into that point, but it's an extremely political choice to make if you think about it. All of these people who are loyal to one person who is tangentially loyal to us are now going to be stationed on all of these ships. Now, from a basic for now perspective, that's logical. They are there as bodyguards to defend the telepaths. And that's probably one of the reasons why Shakar is like, this is just a duh for me. Why wouldn't you do this? But there's a lot of problems with that, especially in the eventually possibility. Or the possibility of people who don't really trust the Narns. I know it's hard to remember this, but as recently as three years ago, in lore... The Narn were a severe aggressor race who were fairly antagonistic and didn't really do much other than, shall we say, politicize amongst the lesser races. So, yeah. Now, I'm sorry, I, I should put lesser races there because obviously I don't mean that legitimately. So, I forgot to do the quote unquote. quotes. Um, <laughs> I do like how Delenn outmaneuvers Sheridan, by the way. It's like, I have, I have told them that you will attend, and if you do not attend, then I will be lying. And it's acceptable to lie to save face for another, but I will be publicly dishonored if you do not attend. And Sheridan's like, okay, fine, fine, God. But I also like how she maneuvers around him throughout the course of that entire scene to basically just to get him to smile. It's nice, the way it's presented. And it shows how... The two of them are becoming kind of closer, um, and that inter interdynamic between the two is getting more fleshed out, I think is the word I want to use there, more in-depth. Because it, we are now at the point where Delenn feels comfortable enough to flat out be like, hey. So I have a note here. I don't think I'm going to bring the controversy box down on this one, even though this one's borderline. I'd rather just talk about it now. Because several religious representatives, representatives of various churches, come to B5. They come there as basically part of the anti-Clark resistance. They come carrying information and intelligence on what is actually happening back on Earth, at least ostensibly. And they do, at the very least, carry the information of how things are going. There's active resistance... There's active cracking down. Uh, things are not going particularly well. Uh, they are being branded as pirates and terrorists and all that fun stuff. And the anti-alien sentiment is getting very strong. The gentleman played by... I wrote down his name. Uh, Mel Winkler, Winklers. Excuse me. I like Mel Winkler. He doesn't do a lot of roles, but I like him when I see him. Uh, the gentleman played by him. He was the reverend. He... Uh, he actually nails a really great quote. It was so great, I actually decided to write it down. I'd rather do something and be wrong about it than choose not to do anything for fear. I am paraphrasing, but that is what he says. It's an interesting quote. It's not exactly the most correct quote in the universe, and there's a lot of flaws in its logic, but at the same time, when you don't know what the truth is, when you lack the information to really make a proper... make a proper informed choice... You have to choose to do. Well, you have to decide if you're going to choose to do or if you're going to choose not to do for fear. It's, it's an interesting comment. 
And uh, it kind of helps to explain one of the reasons why he was willing to come out to B5 on, on faith, basically, ironically enough. The reason I was going to bring down the controversy box is the idea of the churches being used as intel, because that's not a new idea. In fact, that's a really, really old idea. Thing is, while a lot of negativity can and has been pointed at religions, plural, I'm not calling anyone in specific out, uh, across human history, a lot of unpleasant stuff, and then some really unpleasant stuff, and then some horrifically unpleasant stuff, the harsh truth is people tend to gloss over the good things that have also come from religions. I'm not saying this to push any agenda. I'm merely pointing out the facts of what is. For example, if not for the usages of the church, some churches, I really should make this more clear, I'm being too generalized, some churches in what is colloquially referred to as the Dark Ages, correctly or incorrectly, had a lot of, went a large way towards making sure that literacy maintained a thing, that books were a thing, that knowledge was carried forward, that ideas were carried forward, that technology was carried forward. Back before the printing press, which I've said for many years is the big movement forward for human species as far as technologically speaking, churches were a very valuable commodity, for lack of a better term, for maintaining that kind of knowledge and information, that intel. Now, I'm not going to go anything else, but I just point this out because I do find it interesting how people almost universally focus on the negative. This isn't really restricted to just religions or churches or faith or belief or anything like that. People tend to do that in general. One of the basic precepts I had when I made my show five years ago was, you know what, I'm sick of hearing all this negative crap on the internet about games and about media and Star Trek and Babylon 5. I'd like to just be positive about it. Now, I am fairly honest with you guys, and I don't hold back criticisms, but I think most people who watch me with for any length of time would agree that I am an overwhelmingly positive in individual, especially with regards to the content of my show. I admit that is a little bit of pendulum effect on my part, and I'm not going to lie about that or try to hide or disguise that, but I do that because in this case I think it's necessary, because I don't think that many other people are doing it. Too many people focus on the negative. And I think that is a shame. So for me, the idea that these people would have the ability to bring forth this intel, which will be helpful, by the way, to Babylon 5, not only makes perfect sense, but it's the kind of thing that I actually applaud for the logic behind it. For the idea that the Clark administration, because so, there's, there's a hint of information out of that too, it showcases that the Clark administration is not actually strong enough to crack down on the church yet. They can't actually actively push down the church. And I say the church. That is, of course, an extremely generic term. What I really mean is the various religious groups that still have some degree of position and, and uh, uh, backing within the course of Earth, right? Because the, you notice they went out of the way to showcase multiple people from multiple religions unifying in order to fight against a common enemy, which is a nice message by itself, by the way, and very in keeping with Babylon 5's, you know, core theme, as I've put, you know, the unification despite differences thing. But again, emphasizes that the Clark administration can't just shut down these churches, these religions, um, these faiths. And I think that's done not just from a logical setting-building perspective, but also because that's kind of this episode's message as a whole for good and for bad. This episode is not just a hope spot. A hope spot is when it's like, oh, things are going to be better. No, thing is everything worse and everything is horrible. This episode is a very concrete and solid win for the good guys in every respect. It's one of the ways the A plot and the B plot, B plot tie in very directly. So to, to continue really quick here, because um, I'm getting ahead of myself here, I love the dynamic between the religious leaders. It's a shame that, you know, everyone except for uh, the Reverend doesn't really get a lot of lines, but there's still some good banter there, and there's some good interaction. Um, I like his approach, the Reverend again, but I love most of all the way he convinces Sheridan. He does it by not convincing him. I've actually used this scene when referencing certain things in real life to other people. This scene and a scene in the episode First Contact, not, not the movie, the episode First Contact over in TNG. In both cases, someone involved convinced someone of something by going out of their way to not try to convince them. 
And the reverend doesn't say, you need to appeal to God. He doesn't say, you need to go do this. I don't know why I'm affecting an accent. I'm sorry. I don't mean to do that. <laughs> I was just trying to use a voice other than my own. I will use this voice instead. No, I'm kidding. But he doesn't say, you know, you need to appeal to God. He doesn't say, you need to do this. You need to do exactly what I do or else you're screwed. He just, he says, you know, if I sweep, I mean, I'm just going to cut to it because the analogy he uses is fantastic. If I sweep my floor, all I've done is sweep my floor. But if I help you, then I've helped you. And I really like that approach and that analogy. Because what's being said there is that on multiple levels, even on a basic functional survivalist mentality, you are accomplishing more by helping someone else even in doing the same task. Yeah, okay, let's just do something really basic. Sweeping the floor. Okay, let's say I sweep my floor. What has been accomplished? My floor has been sweeped. Woo! Let's say I sweep my fl friend's floor. What has been accomplished? His floor has been sweeped, and I've helped him. He and I have gotten time to spend together, or she and I, or whatever, and another person is now benefited from this, in addition to the fact that I am benefited from this by the company, in addition to the fact that we are growing further bonds between each other. I've said it before and I've said it again, humans are social creatures. We need that social interaction thing. You cannot tell me that there is no benefit to helping someone else. You can't. So, at least not possibly, pathetic, or potentially. So I love that simple analogy to get across his point. Yeah, I could, you know, you could keep, keep sweeping your own thing and, and just keep to yourself and not let anyone come over and help you, or you could say, hey, Delenn, this thing's really bugging me, really badly. I like that. And then he invites her over. She brings a fresh perspective on things. And then they figure out the bleeding obvious. Now, I'd make fun of that because it does feel like a bit of a writing cheat. I mean, <laughs> maybe Sheridan never took art class. I, I, I was taught at a very, very, very young age that one of the there, there are two ways to emphasize something. You either emphasize the thing or you emphasize everything around the thing. Positive and negative contrast, right? So that's the kind of thing that would probably occur to me immediately. But again, I learned that in art class. I didn't learn that in military tactics or strategy or whatever. But I'm willing to forgive it. And you know why? Because I've been suck stuck on something stupid many times in my life. And I bet you have too. I bet there's been something where you just can't figure it out. I, I, I can't even tell you how many times back at work, back when I used to work uh, networking, I would have this issue and I just couldn't freaking figure it out. And when I finally did it, it was something so stupid. It was so obvious. It was just, ugh, that was it? That was the problem? Really? Because we are kind of like that. I've actually referenced this before, uh, semi-recently, actually. I forget if it was in Voyager B5. I've been recording a lot lately to get prepared for Ma Andromeda. Which is funny, because I think, uh, yeah, Andromeda will have actually already come out by the time you're hearing this. <laughs> Give you an idea of how far in advance I do these. Um, but, you know, you, you, you get locked in. It gets to the point where your mind starts patterning itself. I have to do this. Well, I can't do this, and I can't do this. Therefore, I can't do this. And you get locked into that pattern of, well, this is what I can't do. Well, this is what I can't do. Well, maybe if I try it, then, no, I can't do that because of this. Well, if I try it, no, I can't do because of this. And you get locked in. It's one of the reasons additional perspectives help, either from bringing someone else into the project or from taking some time away from it and allowing your mind to reduce those patterns away. So now you go back to it and those patterns aren't there. And it's like, oh, this, duh. So I totally buy the fact that Sheridan didn't actually pick up the negative contrast thing. It's especially interesting because this episode, once again, brings up the question of the Shadow's motives. Why? Why bother to do all this just to go after that? I mean, all they're going to go after is the weak and the damaged, right? There's a lot of possible motives there, but I digress. Real quick, um, I love the... <laughs> I, I love the scene... In, in the reverend uh, in in the church, but I'm actually going to cover that in a bit because I think it's more relevant to the second plot. It's a great way to tie the two in more or less directly together. Uh, the white stars right at the end. First of all, that is a very smart move on behalf of Delenn, the Rangers, and the Membari, keeping an entire fleet of these super ships hidden and secret. That is brilliant and exactly what you should do. One of the worst things you can do militarily is come out swinging with your biggest gun. 
You don't do that, especially if you don't really know the full nature and strength of your enemy. You keep that hidden until you either need it, or until it's a situation where you now have some kind of advantage and can take full use of it. B5 has actually already covered this particular form of strategy. I forget the episode, the specific episode. It was part of the three-parter when they had to send the White Star to go take out that one shadow vessel that was back in Seoul, the, the, the Hearth system. And uh, I liked that, and I like it here for the exact same reason. And now, not only do we have a weapon that can hurt the shadows, the telepaths, not only do we have an understanding of their tactics, not only do we have a lot of people unifying to fight them, but we've also got a fleet of White Stars. I almost said Death Stars. We have a fleet of White Stars now. Like I said... We've got a real, genuine victory in this episode. Which brings me to the other thing. <laughs> Londo's movements in this episode are ruddy brilliant. They are brilliant. It really helps highlight something that I've pointed out several times. It's probably the, the clearest thing that just lays two character points bare. In this episode, we know Lord Rifa fully and completely, and we know Londo. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So Londo comes in, and anybody watching this, and I would honestly like to know how many of you thought this as well, because I did. I thought this was Londo's final descent into true villainy. He is now going to go against one of the other main characters, who, if you remember, I just established in the last episode, and has been established for most of this season, Jakar is one of the good guys now. He is part of the team. You know what I mean by that. He's part of the good guys. He's, he's part of the crew that the, the viewers are rooting for. For Londo to directly go after Jakar pretty much firmly puts him in the villain category, especially under threats of execution. And then what he does to Veer is horrifying. He doesn't just threaten Veer. He threatens Veer and then threatens his family and then threatens to do really, really, really horrible things to him and to his family. And he lays it down. It's brutal, and it's unforgiving. And again, when I first saw this, I was like, Oh, God, Londo's gone. Londo is gone. Shortly thereafter, the minister uh, meets with Lord Reef. And what's funny is the minister was just eyeballing Reef. That's actually how I wrote down my note here. And it means that the minister is smart enough to recognize that Reefa is just politicking. And so he just kind of keeps a wary distance to him the whole time. I especially like it because the minister basically flat out refuses to just choose right then and there Rifa, And then Rifa's like, oh, posture, posture, posture. And the minister says flat out, this must end. And I must choose a side. And the emperor doesn't give a crap. In other words, what he is saying, to get through all the Centauri speak, is I get to decide which one of you keeps going. Rifa says, oh, yes, I agree. We will deal with the situation. Londo says, ah. Tell you what, I'll resolve this myself through action. And he does that right after Veer delivers the information. So again, you know, he said, I, I will deal with something that has been long since been a thorn in the side of the Centauri. And he's absolutely speaking the truth there. But we are meant to think he's referring to Jakar when he is most assuredly not. See, what I love about the brilliance of this episode, both in character and out, is until a scene very close to the end of the episode, we are, every step of the way, made to believe that Londo has gone full villain. The first scene, I'm skipping ahead of my notes just a little bit, but the first scene that we see that really shows something else is when he rescues Veer. His attitude, his body language, his tonality are completely different there. Are you okay, Veer? I've got you. Come on, let's get out of here. That is not the same man that screamed and ranted about stripping his family naked in the street and whipping them. And that's the first moment where I, I remember this, when I was watching this back then, I was like, wait. And that's when I put two and two together, because Rifa has a telepath. Londo brilliantly used Veer for two reasons. Because Veer does actually have cred with the Narn, and because Veer is a good person. Thus, Veer had to be told to be made to believe that Londo was this horrible, vicious person, which Rifa wouldn't even consider vicious and horrible. But it would be something that would bother Veer, which means it would be at the surface of his thoughts and thus easier to scan by the telepaths, ensuring that he isn't so mentally damaged in the process. 
when he is quite literally mind-raped. Then, he also, being a decent person, and this whole thing, uh, would thus have cred with Shakar in order to be able to get this information to him. And, of course, finally, and most importantly, he would then you know, be much relieved when he learned the truth. No, no, we're not going after Shakar. That's ridiculous. No, we're going after Rifa. And, of course, he couldn't tell Veer any of this before because of the telepath. Londo's right. And it's a bit of a shame because Veer at the end is like, I thought I knew you. And yet the really weird thing is, this is Londo's first step, really, to coming away from being a villain. He has done that full arc all the way up until being a villain, up until and including the uh, Veer Sik uh, Kodo or whatever, uh, Sik Kodo Veer or something like that, you know what I mean. This is him finally be beginning arguably his third character arc at this point in time, third or second, moving back towards the side of the good guys, moving back towards redemption. And what's funny is technically we kind of knew this was coming, not just because of the prophecy, but because we've seen the future, where Emperor Londo wants to do good. You remember that? So we've already got this impression that Londo is a better person than he is portrayed to be. Or at the very least, wants to be a better person than he's portrayed to be. Now, I admit, I like Londo's character a lot. It's one of the most in-depth, fle fully fleshed out, awesome characters I've seen in fiction in a long frickin' time. Him and Jakar are right up there as my favorite characters in this show, and I say that without hesitation. And I do like a well-done redemption story. And it is my opinion that Londo is going to have one, that he is going to start shifting back towards our side. We'll see, though. And I will freely admit, it's really up to us to decide if he does that or not. I've actually brought that question up before to my viewers. Do you think he can be redeemed? Do you think he could turn around? Do you think he can shift sides? And I got a variety of responses to it, which is awesome! You always know you have a great character when a lot of people see it in a different way. <laughs> So, a couple other notes about the Londo side plot. Um, I like how Jakar is actually quite cordial to Veer, as are his men. But not really nice, not really friends, just cordial. But he is willing to listen once he mentions Natoth. Then, Rifa gets Veer and offers him a token carrot. And I mean within seconds of offering it. Like, what happens is Veer says... And then Reef is like, oh, well, okay, bring in the mind rape. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that we really know who Rifa is in this. It's, it's completely laid bare. Rifa is an obvious boorish T Rex. He is just a, he is a bad politician. He does big, streeping swides, strides, excuse me. There's no subtlety to him, there's no s complexity to him. There's no actual reason to stay loyal to him, either, if you think about it. That is, th that what, how he reacts with Veer is so obvious and is so indicative of his approach to power, to being in charge. Rifa wants to be the one on top. Londo wants to be the one manipulating behind the scenes. I've already talked about the difference here. But Rifa is just so blatant in his strides and so self-sure of him. Yeah, he's so self-sure, so sure of himself. It doesn't even occur to him that he's been outplayed. Even when Londo starts speechifying, he's just standing there. Even when Jakar comes up and tells them about how they're going to execute him, he's just kind of standing there. It's not until they actually start charging that it finally penetrates that thick skull of his that, oh crap, I'm about to die. And that's when it finally occurs to him that he has lost for all his manipulating, for all his politicking, he was hacking at his problems with a giant axe. Londo defeated him by ensuring that by the time he even picked up that axe, he was already doomed. We get some very good shots of Narn, by the way. I think these are our first real shots of Narn after the bombardment. It's horrifying. They even talk about the, the, the particulate matter which isn't even going to settle for years. Oh, my God. And that's true. That's exactly what it should be. Narn should be devastated to the point where it actually cannot self-subsist. They require external help to make the planet functional again because of the level of devastation done to them, which was actually done by Rifa, 
and against Londo's advice. So that was actually true, what Londo says in this episode. What's funny is Rifa says the same damn thing, because he wants to take credit for it. I find that funny because Rifa is so blatant about, I want to take credit for things, I want to take credit for things. Again, the obvious thing. That's why he's on Narn personally, to take credit for taking in the last of the Shakari. And yet it is that same blatant, oh yeah, he did it, that he uses to help convince the Narns. By the way, I know you'll be helping me out, but uh, this guy is a horrible person. He pretty much is the reason why Narn was bombed. So if you want to destroy him, I mean, you know. Um... Londo, Lon, so I've actually heard this debated for some time. It's such a little point. Do you think Londo told Jakar of the plan before the hologram scene? I think he did, for two reasons. One, Jakar clearly was just like, eh, okay, unconcerned, pulls out the thing, and flat out, you know, Rifa's like, what are you waiting for? Jakar pulls out the thing and says, this. Where'd he get it from? How much did he know about its contents? Now, Londo does have to convince the Narn a bit of doing what he wants, but notice it's all about convincing the Narn, not Jakar himself. I think Londo actually let Jakar in on what he was doing. Just my, my thinking on the matter. And then... <laughs> and then Londo's core mentality is utterly laid bare. I've talked about this before because it's my job as an analyst, but this is when the episode, this is when Babylon 5 just lays it out there, takes off the blanket, or takes off the wrapping paper, and you can see what the present is now. Cent uh, Londo cares about his people. I know this has been stated many times before, but it's laid out there in this episode, because ultimately, why he went after Rifa? I mean, yes, you hurt me. You were a political rival, and you killed the only person I actually loved. But you know what, Rifa? You have ruined the Centauri, more or less personally and definitely deliberately. You have ruined us. We are now a people to be feared, who are weakened, and, well, let's just be, let's go ahead and say this, even though this is kind of spoilery, the Centauri, as a people, could be doing a hell of a lot worse soon, pretty much directly because of Rifa. So he says, no, it's not enough to just kill you. I could do that anywhere. I need you and your influence and your house destroyed. I need you and all like you to never be able to hurt our people again. And given Londo's obvious bias against Narn, the fact that Londo is willing to just go to the Narn and be like, here, and work with them and coordinate with them, says volumes about how much he absolutely hates Rifa. And ironically, is one of the more common methods by which to slowly bridge gaps between people. Enemy mine. You know, that situation. And then, one of my favorite scenes in all of Babylon 5 happens as this raucous, joyous music is played as Lord Rifa runs for his life and is beaten to death. There are some disp Despicable people in this show. But in my opinion, Rifa is one of the most despicable. He may not be as evil as some other characters, like the one we'll be meeting in season four. Uh, some would argue Bester is worse, some would argue Clark is worse. And those three, Clark, Bester, and Cartesia, basically form the triad of, of individual villains. You know, not organizations, but actual people within Babylon 5, season one through four. But, uh... <laughs> Rifa... I guess I would call Rifa the Arl Howl, to use the Dragon Age Origins equivalent. While Loghain is more, you know, the, the antagonist of sorts, Arl Howe was the bastard. The self-interested, self-important, I-don't-care-what-happens-to-anyone-else, completely selfishly evil character. And that pretty much describes uh, Lord Rifa. He might actually be the most evil, neutral evil character I can think of right off the top of my head. So, yeah, it was really satisfying watching him get beaten to death. Sorry. 
I've always kind of assumed just personally that the whole point of that song is that the, the person's in hell or whatever hell form takes and then they're like, oh god, help! And the rocks are like, no, you're screwed. <laughs> so, we have had a real win in this episode. We have this fleet, we have a strategy, we have allies, and for the first time, Londo is close to approaching the beginnings of shifting back to our side. And Lord Rifa, a definitive villain, who is definitively against us, has been removed from the picture. As an aside, I like Londo's final quote. Sooner or later, uh, he wanted power, he was interested in himself. I said it from the start. Sooner or later, it will destroy him or us. Better it was him. And I think that's probably the only completely truthful thing he said to, to the minister at the end there. Great episode. Z minus 10 days. It's cool.